going to be in Matthew chapter 24 again today, continuing our series on the end times. Preparing this message, the big problem is there's way too many cool things to talk about. So we had to uh, limit it. According to a recent poll, 41% of Americans think we're living in the end times. Isn't that interesting? The same poll reported that 77% of evangelicals believe that to be true, that we're in the end times. This is not new. My guess is that since about the 1960s, Americans were thinking uh, apocalyptically. Uh, they've been very interested in eschatology, wondering if this era of humanity is possibly the last, if this is the end, where is, where is it going to go from here? And I think that uh, a lot of that has to do with uh, nuclear bombs, right? Hydrogen bombs. I think part of that fear of Armageddon, a great final battle fought with modern technology that wipes out life as we know it, is, uh, is <laughs> understanding human nature in the unpredictability of human nature, that seems like a rational concern to me. That seems reasonable to me. Look at the history of the human race. What travesty have we not done? Where has the human race ever gone that the ground did not drink soon thereafter of human blood? Uh, you think something's beyond the pall, something is impossible that is so inhuman, so sadistic it couldn't happen. And it happens again and again and again. Uh, the history of the human race is a history of blood and, and torture and, and violence. And think about the number of WMDs out there, chemical weapons, biological weapons, nuclear weapons. Then I want to ask you a question. What are the odds that the human race will go another 5,000 years without somebody pushing the wrong button at the wrong time? That's scary. It's going to happen. To... to to bank on the dependability of humans to be rational and reasonable and, and kind-hearted and humanitarian is to ignore human history. So, I mean, it seems reasonable to be concerned about the future when you think about how, uh, you know, we can, you talk about bombing people back into the Stone Age, coming back and then making the rubble bounce, nuke them till they glow. We have enough nuclear weapons across the world to destroy life several times over. Maybe not all life. There may be hope for rats and cockroaches. If, if that gives you any hope. Uh, I, I was expecting you to be able to read into it. Yeah. And then there's ecological disasters. Uh, when I was growing up, we were taught that in school that pollution is going to usher in a new ice age. And it's going to shut down. There's not going to be in, uh, we're not going to be able to grow our crops. Now most scientists are telling us that global warming is happening. And a part of me, when I hear all this, like, chicken with their head cut off kind of stuff, a part of me just wants to shrug uh, because of a natural aversion to being an alarmist. Uh, uh, end time stuff, volcanoes, okay, earthquakes, okay, methane buildups underneath the ocean that have caused mass die-offs in the past when they release all this methane, which is worse than CO2 for, as being a, a greenhouse effect. And, and science believes these things have erupted in the past and have caused mass die-offs, and they're just sitting there waiting to go again. Uh, all these doomsday scenarios. And then you think about all the books that are sold with people talking about them, all the money to be made just scaring people. Uh, Dad has pointed out that there's an increase in earthquakes. You can, you can look, U.S. Uh, Geological Survey. But some scientists will tell you, and this seems reasonable, that over the long history of the Earth, periodically the Earth goes through these times of increased seismic activity. So that sounds comforting. Oh, this, is, this happens. It's happened before. Until you look that, uh, in their worldview that when this happened last, there was no civilization, there was no human race, and that it's happened periodically in history when we weren't around. So it's not that comforting to think that, well, we have increased seismic activity at different times in history, but it's never hit the human race in a big way as it has happened in the past. Uh, whether you find that comforting or not, again, up to you. I read an article from uh, the Smithsonian website that noted there's a dramatic increase in volcanoes around the world as well. But they speculated, and this again seems reasonable, 
that what's really happening is that we've got more humans spread out all over the globe uh, with better technology than ever before. So when a volcano erupts, we can document it now, whereas before there may have been just as many volcanoes, but we weren't aware. Uh, but there's definitely in the last few years been a lot of interruption of air f traffic and whatnot from different volcanoes going. Uh, the same can be said of uh, NEOs, near earth objects. It seems like every time I turn on the news today, an asteroid or comet is whizzing by the Earth. Have you noticed that? It's just all the time. In fact, did you know that today there's a, a one that's dubbed a city killer? They're big enough to destroy cities. It's whizzing by the Earth. Uh, it's not going to be within the orbit of the moon. We've had a couple of them that close, which is scary, uh, just in the last couple of years. But this one's outside the orbit of the moon. Science have plotted its trajectory, and it isn't a big concern. But the thing is, is even today, we've got one of these city killers whizzing by the Earth. These things happen all the time. Uh, remember just last year in Russia, remember that big one? Uh, the shock wave from that, when it exploded in the sky, damaged buildings, shattered windows, set off car alarms, 1,000, one report said 1,200 people were injured by it. It could have been a lot, lot, lot worse. It blew up in this relatively unpopulated area, fairly high up into the atmosphere. And that's good because when it blew up, it had the force of 100 atomic bombs. I went on a website from NASA, and uh, it stated that in the 1990s, we knew of a handful, less than 10, of these dangerous NEOs, near-Earth objects, uh, chunk, space junk that's going close enough that it's a concern to the planet Earth. Now we know, since the 1990s, there's approximately 11,000 of them orbiting around, periodically coming near the Earth. Listen to this, 1,000 of them are larger than a kilometer across, which would be devastating if they hit the Earth. So I checked out another website that was from the American Meteor Society, which was established in 1911, not the website, the American Media Society. Uh, they recorded uh, 467 fireballs over the U.S. in 2005. 467 fireballs. I saw a fireball once. Uh, it was gorgeous. I was in, I've seen a lot of meteors that are whoosh, 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 whoosh. But the fi fireballs are the cool ones. And I was in the backyard with Dad. I, I think we were working on uh, putting up the, uh, the pool, not the present incarnation, but a previous pool. And uh, I saw this thing that was moving slow across the sky, and it was just burning and going... Wow, that is a meteor. That's really cool. It was so entrancing. You ever see that on those sh TV shows and movies where people are, uh, uh, they can't say anything? I couldn't say anything until it was almost gone. I said, Dad, Dad. And I don't know, I don't think it was too late for him. It was just amazing to see this beautiful, fiery, smoky thing moving slowly across the sky. And in, in 2005, 467 were recorded over the U.S. It's been increasing every year since then. Last year, we didn't have 467. We had 561. Actually, we had 3,561 uh, fireballs recorded over the U.S. Uh, last year. And then what about wars and famines? You know, the last century was the bloodiest by far in human history. As we reached higher levels of education, the most educated nation in Europe, uh, Germany, the most educated nation in Asia, Japan, led us uh, to Im immense amount of destruction and misery and pain around the world. Uh, rich nations. Certainly, we have more people now and better news coverage of when genocide and, and hor horrific events are going around. So I, I kind of wonder, on a per capita basis, is the world getting more dangerous or we're just hearing about it more? Uh, so the question is, why should we pay attention to these things as Christians? Well, I just don't like to be scared. I like to live in a bubble and not think about things. Okay, uh, I don't know what to do with that. Uh, but why should we talk about these kinds of things? Why should we think about those kinds of things? Uh, we focus in, in, at Foundation Bible Church a lot more on destination than the minor details of the process. Destination over process. In fact, uh, when you look at our statement of beliefs, we believe that Jesus is coming. We believe that Jesus is coming back to make things right. We don't mingle, we don't mince, I should say, about the, uh, about the details. That doesn't mean we don't have strong opinions about them, but that's not 
what we need to be united on as believers. It's okay for different Christians to have different views than the ones I'm going to be teaching today. That doesn't mean you're unchristian. That doesn't mean that you're wrong, I'm right. It's okay to have different views on this, as long as they're based on this, right? As long as they're based on this. Uh, so we're going to focus more, as a church, always on destination, more than the process. However, the details, guess what? They're in there. The details are in the book. And there are different ways to count, but generally speaking, one out of every ten verses in the Bible have to do with events that haven't happened yet. You mean every ten verses are about future events, about the end times? Yeah. The Bible is packed with information about the end times. We need to be careful not to say, well, I'm not an alarmist, so I'd rather ignore those, or it's too difficult, so I'd rather not think about it, or it causes too much division or controversy, so it's not worth thinking about it. We would be neglecting 10%. That's a bad idea if you believe this book is from Holy God. So I'm asking myself, why would God put this in there? There has to be a reason. So again, why would we focus on these things? Because... Jesus told us, he told us to be on the watch, to be on the alert for these things. So turn to Matthew chapter 24, if you haven't already. Matthew chapter 24, and I'm going to look at verses 3 through 14. <clears throat> so disciples are, are asking Jesus some questions. As Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately. Tell us, they said, when will this happen, and what will be the sign of your coming at the end of the age? Isn't it neat that they actually ask him a question? It, the Bible just doesn't say, Jesus is coming again, that should be enough for you. The disciples come to him and say, is there going to be a sign? Is there any way we can know that we can prepare, that we can get ready? Jesus answered them, watch out that no one will deceive you. So he's saying, be alert. You need to be aware of these things so that you won't be deceived. For many will come in my name, claiming I'm the Messiah, and they will deceive many. You will hear of wars and rumors of wars. But see to it that you're not alarmed. Such things are going to have to happen. But the end is still to come. Nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines and earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginnings of the birth pains. Well, what are birth pains? Birth pains are the pains you get before you're about to give a child. They let you know something's coming. Then you will be handed over to be persecuted and to be put to death. Well, I think there's another reason that we don't like to study the end times sometimes, right? I want a cheerful message, something perky. And you will, you know, I don't think we get a lot of perky in the scriptures. Then you will be handed over to the people you're persecuted and put to death, and you will be hated by all the nations because of me. And at that time, many will turn away from the faith, and they will betray and hate each other, these people who turn away. And many false prophets will appear and deceive many people. Because of the increase of wickedness, as evil goes up, the love of most will grow cold. That's, a, that's like gravity. I drop this, see that? It always goes down. Wickedness, sin, unrighteousness increases, love decreases. That's the way it goes. The more self-centered and self-absorbed we are, the less love, the less we care about other people. We're just full of ourselves. Because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most will grow cold, but whoever stands firm to the end will be saved. So there's some things then that must happen before Christ returns. Now, there's a sense in which the return of Christ has always been imminent. Uh, ever since he returned to heaven, Christians were told to watch. They were supposed to wait. They were supposed to look to the skies to be ready uh, for Christ's return. But we can see as we progress through history that more things that the scriptures tell us are going to happen before the end times are being checked off. These things have been checked off, many of them in my life, in my parents' lives that at any other point in human history, they just weren't. Now, they were supposed to, as Christians, be ready for Christ's return at any moment. However, 
a lot of the things that Christ is talking about just were not in place when, uh, uh, in past generations. So why should we study eschatology? And again, that's a really good question because, well, we can't do anything about it. Well, actually, that might not be entirely true. I'm not going to get into that today, but there's a sense where we may be able to hasten the Lord's return. Uh, many people have actually brought a black eye to Christianity because what? They do what, what we're told you can't do. We're told nobody knows the day or the time, and so people get out there and they write books and they go on television saying what? The day and the time. They get a lot of attention, but they give a black eye to Christianity, and people start to think that the end, talking about the end times is a joke. It isn't a joke. It's very serious. And again, over 10% of the scriptures deal with it. There are things that are happening now that the Bible talks about that just could not have happened, occurred in the past. Wars and rumors of wars and a bunch of disasters. And these are called birth pangs. In other words, they're supposed to let us know that the earth is coming. When birth pains begin, what do we do? We rush mama to the hospital. Birth pains let us know that something momentous is about to occur. Well, Jesus is telling us these things, and we're supposed to study them. And the rumor of them, not just them happening, but the, the rumor of them happening, which is interesting, isn't it? The rumor of them, the hearing of them, is going to increase in the final days, in the last days when the days are short. I bet, though, when the Roman Empire fell, Rome was called the Eternal City. It had become Christian. The Roman Empire was a Christian empire. When the Roman Empire fell, do you think Christians felt like that was the end times? Of course they did. In fact, we know historically that they talked about it. They thought, wow, Christ must be returning soon. Everything is falling apart. Another time, a sign that Jesus points to is increased persecution. Christ said this when he was still alive prior to persecution of his followers. When Christ said this, uh, his followers hadn't been persecuted yet. They're about, to, they're about to hit this horrendous persecution at the hands of the Roman Empire. Horrible. Families torn apart. Children murdered and ripped apart by lions. Uh, Nero took Christians through parties, tied Christians to poles, wrapped them in leather, doused, doused them in oil, and used them to torch, as torches to light his party. You could have got out of that if you denied the name of Jesus Christ, cursed God, and got free. The Romans were willing uh, to let you be free from persecution, all you had to do was deny Jesus Christ. Similar thing happened years later in Japan. It was called a fumie when they put a picture of Christ on the ground, and Christians had all they had to do was step on it, spit on it, and they could be set free. Otherwise, many of them were killed, even executed, hanging upside down. Which goes to show you, Roman Empire to Japan, the devil didn't learn a lot of new tricks. He enjoyed it the first time around. He thought he'd try it again. When Christ said that, there was no persecution. When persecution hit, I bet the early church thought that was the end times. But you know what? Today, we have more persecution than we did at the time of Christ. We are living in an artificial bubble here in the United States where we can pray about health, wealth, and prosperity because we don't have to pray, Lord, don't let the authorities find our church today. We're living in this, in this bubble, and then we find so many things to complain about all the time Meanwhile, our brothers and sisters are dying because they will not reject the name of Jesus Christ. And, oh, Lord, I've got a hangnail today. <coughs> Did you know that the Bible tells us that Christ, one of the things he's waiting for is the full number of martyrs to be filled? And right now we have more martyrs than ever before. The other thing I want us to think about is kind of a context for all of this is that the nation of Israel, the Jewish people actually themselves, are themselves a witness. The nation of Israel is a sign. You've heard me say this before. Did you know that uh, there was an island called Wrangell Island? It's still there off the coast of Siberia. That was the last place that there were woolly mammoths. Uh, and they, they, got, they were, were diminished over time. They were dwarf woolly mammoths. They were like six foot tall or something. Uh, and... It's just a neat coincidence of history that there were still woolly mammoths on the planet when Abraham was given this message from God that I'm going to make a great people from you. So God 
took this ancient man a long time ago and says, I'm going to make a great people of you. I'm going to bless the entire world. The whole world is going to be different because of your family. Fast forward thousands of years, and you don't have to believe in God to say, wow, it, uh, Judaism, Christianity, Islam, you can't recognize the world without them. God gave this promise to Abraham, and the world has been altered and changed, and there have been more hospitals and orphanages and in, in uh, places to take care of suffering people in the name of Jesus Christ than anything else ever in the history of the planet. God said, I'm going to bless the world through Abraham. Whoa, lo and behold. Well, it's a secular, it's just chance, maybe. I've, I've had people tell me, well, it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. Well, maybe, okay, maybe. And yet, over thousands of years, it's true. And they've been trying, uh, the, the, the world has tried to stomp out Jews. There's an un, unrealistic hatred towards the Jewish people, disproportionate, that people all over the world rage against them. There have been, there have been uh, hatred in, in Rome, in Russia, in Spain, uh, through the Christian church, uh, in the Muslim nations, Jews have been hated and persecuted, and then and the, the Nazis tried to drive them to ex uh, extinction. Hitler wanted to kill every last Jewish person. And think about it. If you're Satan, you can't fight with the Lord, can you? He's given all these promises that depend on there being Jewish people. And if there's no more Israel, maybe he can knock out God's plan for the future. Maybe, maybe, maybe. There's a lot of hatred for Israel. Israel has been scattered and brought back as a nation. It's scattered again and brought back. You name me one other people group that has endured this, been scattered, spread all over the globe like this, brought back in their country today. This is a miracle before everybody's eyes. Pay attention. The Lord is working. Don't miss this. Okay, let's look now from from uh, Matthew chapter 14, <coughs> I'm sorry, Matthew chapter 24, verse 14. This gospel of the kingdom, Jesus is saying, shall be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all the nations, and then the end will come. So we talked about there being a, a full number of martyrs. We talked about the nation of Israel. The gospel of the kingdom of God has to be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all the nations, and then the world will come. In my lifetime, every nation on the planet uh, has at least one Christian. In my lifetime, every nation on the planet has at least one church. In 1980, there were 10 Christians in the entire country of Mongolia. They were saved as students while studying overseas, which goes to show you how important student ministry is. Groups like Crew, Campus Crusade, uh, it goes to show you how important that is because those guys got saved. They became Christians while studying many of them in Germany. They returned back to Mongolia, and God worked with that, with that little seed. In 1980, there were 10 Christians in Mongolia. In the 1990s, just 10, 15 years later, the New Testament was translated for the first time into Mongolian. 1990s. The Jesus film from Campus Crusade was shown at all the movie theaters in, tw in the year 20 2000. The whole Bible was translated into Mongolian. In, in Mongolia, Mongolia itself started to send out mess uh, missionaries to the other nations in the year 2000. Today, there's over 60,000 Christians. Now, you might say, uh, well, I heard you say, wow, and that's cool. But you might say 60,000 Christians in a nation. Well, Mongolia is not a very populated nation. It's sparse. But still... 60,000, that's not a lot. They started with 10 in 1980. Look around you. There's a lot more than 10 right here. What could God do in 35 years with what we've got right here? Can there be 60,000 Christians? Well, not if we're zombies. Not if we think we're saved just to sit and be blessed. People... The Lord is doing great things, and we're going to miss it unless we join the program. Let's go out there and start sharing our faith with everybody we can. We only have so much impact and influence in this world. Our lives are so short. We don't reach that far. Let's reach those we can. Let's love those we can. Let's bring challenging truth. And sometimes when you have to wake up a sleepwalker, they don't like it. But if they're walking towards the edge of a cliff, the loving thing to do is not to make them comfortable on their way out. Hey, can, I, can I get an amen for that? Let's love people enough to get outside of our own comfort zone. 
Let's love people enough that it's okay if they hate us, just as long as some people get saved. Matthew 15, now, uh, Matthew chapter 24, uh, from uh, verse 15, and I'm going to go to verse 22. So, when you see standing in the holy place the abomination that causes desolation, spoken of through the prophet Daniel, let the, let the reader understand, then let those who are in Judea flee to the, flee to the mountains. So the abomination that caused desolation uh, was fulfilled once with this uh, nasty uh, Hellenistic ruler that uh, conquered Israel in the intertestamental period. He stood in the temple, he desecrated the temple, he, he made it a temple to the Greek gods. But now Jesus is saying there's going to be another guy. The, that guy was just a, a, like an echo, a forward echo of the guy that's really coming. He, he was, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? foretelling of the guy that's going to come, and this nasty guy is going to stand right in the temple. Then, when that happens, he said, the people in the area start running to shelter. Let no one in the housetop go down and, and don't stop to pack, he says. Let no one uh, in the field go back to take their cloak. How dreadful it will be in those days for pregnant women and nursing mothers. So I pray that it doesn't happen then. I don't know when it's gonna, if it's going to happen in the winter or not, but I pray that it won't. Pray that your flight will not take place in the winter or on the Sabbath, for then there will be great distress, unequaled from the beginning of the world until now, never to be equaled again. There's a time coming of great distress for the entire world that's going to be worse than anything that's ever happened, and when it hits, there's never going to be anything that bad again. If those days had not been cut short, no one would survive, but for the sake of the elect, the people that are saved at this time, uh, those days are going to be cut short. Now, isn't that weird? That is a weird passage. That's an interesting passage. First, Christ is clearly saying that we should be aware that, of what's coming. So, right? Christ is saying, be aware of what's coming so you can be prepared and that people in the area around Jerusalem, you can now get it ready to run and hide. But there's something else that's going on here, and I think it probably bothered the early Christians. The book of Matthew, written shortly after the time of Christ. If you hear anyone on television tell you uh, the Bible was put together hundreds of years later, just th stop and think for a while, why would the book of Matthew talk about the nation of Israel and the temple being intact if it, wasn't, if it was written after 70 AD? That makes no sense at all. Matthew is obviously written very early on, aside from the fact, again, that we have people talking about the book of Matthew very early. We have their letters. They quote from the book of Matthew even before the canon of Scripture was put together. The book of Matthew must have been written before 70 AD because it talks about the temple being there. And Christ gives this prophecy where this antichrist, this beast, this wicked man has to stand in the temple. There is no temple, and that happened early in the history of the church. I think that had to rock the faith of some people. Wait a second. How can the end times come? Jesus gave a prophecy, and there is no temple. Guess what? There is still no temple. Where the temple used to be, you ever see the pictures of Jerusalem? There's that golden mosque, the dome on the rock. That mosque is built where the, two Jewish, the previous Jewish temples actually was. Now, it doesn't cover the whole temple complex, so I don't know if the Jews have to build it in that place. Some people think the mosque has to come down in order for the temple to be rebuilt, or it could be built uh, in a separate place of the Temple Mount. I don't, I don't understand any of that. But there is no temple there today, meaning how can, G how can this Antichrist stand in the temple and cause the desolation of the temple if there is no temple? Well, if you're listening to Dad's message the last three weeks, you notice that the Bible seems to talk about two different events when Christ is coming back. Now listen, I understand that there's tons of good Christian people that don't believe in the rapture. I'm really cool with that. You can be my brother. I can do ministry with you. I've got a, one of my best friends on the planet doesn't believe in the rapture. He, he's a Christian missionary. That's okay. We can agree to disagree. There's Christians that argue when the rapture will take place. That's fine. I'm not going to get into all of that right now. But I feel like Jesus, the Bible talks about two comings of Jesus Christ that we're waiting for. One time when Jesus comes, the world's in distress and agony and, 
in, in the throes of despair, and Jesus Christ comes. Another time, Jesus is talking about him coming. He says, people are going to get getting married. They're going to be working in the field. They're going to run their businesses. That's two different events, people. It seems to me like those are two very different events. And is it possible then that there's space between these two events, some say seven years, some say three and a half years, whatever, that in the space between those two events that the temple could be rebuilt at that time? Uh, there's actually several different possibilities. One, that Jesus was talking metaphorically, and I think for the early Christians, when the temple's destroyed, your, your brain is going to start thinking, well, how can this be true? I, I know God's true in my life, in my heart, in all these prophecies in Scripture come true, but this one just can't come true. There's no Jewish people, there's no nation of Israel, and there's no temple, so he must have been speaking uh, not about a physical temple. It must be a metaphysical temple. Well, I don't believe that. <laughs> don't believe that at all. The prophecies that came true, they came true in a very real physical sense. Uh, but that's one place where Christians might go, and I can understand that feeling. Uh, secondly, maybe Jesus won't come back yet until the temple is rebuilt, in which case Christ's return is not so imminent like the Bible teaches. We're kind of waiting waiting, waiting, waiting for something to happen in Jerusalem, for the temple to be built. Uh, three, there's temp there are portions of the temple that are still standing, like the Wailing Wall, and this temple, the temple foundation is still there. So maybe you could build it next to the temple on the mount. The mosque maybe doesn't have, the, I'm sorry, the mosque, the dome on the rock. Maybe the mosque doesn't have to come down. There's plenty of space up there for, a, for another large structure. Uh, maybe that could be enough. Uh, maybe some people think that would be a tabernacle, like when the Jews were tra traveling in the wilderness before they conquered Jerusalem, before there was a physical temple, remember, before there was a stone temple, they had a temple that was a tent. So maybe some people think there could be a tent set back up in Jerusalem somewhere, and, and that would be enough, that would suffice, and then the, this, this wicked man comes there and declares peace, and, and, and uh, he's going to unite the world, and he's going to desecrate the temple by, by his great boasts in the temple. Uh, and maybe they could even offer sacrifices then in that temporary temple. But, but a temple actually could be, and there's the fifth option, a temple could be built between Christ's first return, which we're talking about is the rapture, the raptura, and in his second return when he sets up the millennial kingdom. And for years growing up, I always heard about uh, there were rich forces, powerful forces in Israel that want to remake the temple. But I always heard that from Christian sources, and so I wondered about that. Was that just wishful thinking? Christians are saying, yeah, it's happening, it's happening. But in the last year, something funny happened on Facebook, something cool. A number of my Muslim friends started to complain online. Do you know the Jews want to rebuild the temple? And they were all up in arms. They want to rebuild the temple where, where the Dome of the Rock is. They, they want to rebuild the temple, and they were just angry. And then while they were complaining, one of my Jewish friends <coughs> got on, and she happily jumped in the conversation, gleefully confirmed, yep, uh, we're planning to rebuild the temple. That's the plan, and, and plans are already underway. And there, uh, many of the temple devices, the different instruments that you're supposed to use in the temple, they've already been created. They're sitting and waiting, and the building materials have already been brought together. They're sitting and waiting for that opportunity to put up the temple up in quick order. The pieces are in place. And you can go online and see some of the materials in the temple instruments that have already been collected in anticipation of the next temple being built. But it's more than just a temple. We're talking about the people of Israel being a, a witness, that the people of Israel are a sign. The temple was uh, destroyed in 70 AD. So was the nation of Israel, and it stayed destroyed until 1948. That's a long time for Christians to read their Bible and say, well, I don't know what Jesus is talking about. I don't know what the Old Testament is talking about. All these prophecies. And so they thought maybe the church is the new Israel. And, and Christians in England even got kind of freaky. And a lot of them thought that the nation of England was the new Israel. That was a theology that they had. Because there is no Israel. Now that there's an Israel again, people can start to interpret it uh, more naturally again. Uh, and there were, as Dad has pointed out, there's always been Christians throughout the last almost 2,000 years that said, yeah, there's no Israel, but there's going to be an Israel. There has to be an Israel because the Bible prophesies it. In, in 1948, boom, we have a country again. Think about that. What other people group has ever been scattered that widely? What other people group has ever been hated that much? What other people group has been brought back in their country, reestablished? Not once, but twice. Nothing like it. Again, brothers and sisters, 
Uh, this is an incredible miracle right before our eyes, and we ought to be paying attention. Isaiah 11.10 says, In that day, the root of Jesse will stand as a banner for the peoples. The nations will rally to him. and His resting place will be glorious. <coughs> Excuse me. In that day, the Lord will reach out his hand a second time to reclaim the surviving remnant of his people, the Jews, from Assyria, from Lower Egypt, from Upper Egypt, from Cush and Elam and from Babylonia, from Hamathon and the islands of the Mediterranean. He will raise a banner uh, for the nations and gather the exiles of Israel. He will assemble the, the scattered people of Judah from the four quarters of the earth, from the four corners of the earth. He's going to assemble all the Jewish people. And another passage talks about how God is going to use the Gentile nations as instruments to reestablish Israel, and, and they're going to help them reestablish, and the, the wealth of Gentile nations is going to flow into Israel, which has happened in the United States and European uh, countries and the United Nations, forming the new country of Israel and, and establishing it and, and helping the Jews, flying the Jews back on, on U.S. airplanes and, and, uh, from all over the world. Isn't that interesting that the Bible says not only are they going to be reestablished, but the Gentiles are going to help them reestablish, and that's exactly what happened. It's just a coincidence. Keep telling yourself that. Uh, some of the returns have been absolutely dramatic. This is, this is my, uh, we didn't have to go into this stuff. I'm going into it because I think it's cool. From 1961 to 1964, the Israeli secret police helped 97,000 Jews escape from northern Africa, from Morocco predominantly, into Israel. From 1950 to 1952, Operation Ezra and Nehemiah. You ever hear of those two guys? Ezra and Nehemiah are the guys who led the first group of Jews out of, uh, out, out, out of uh, Persia back into the Promised Land when God allowed them to come back. God prophesied that the Persians would let the people return. And guess what? We have a physical document uh, from the king of Persia that's declaring that not only the Jews but all people groups, the Babylonians would take people and they bring, back, bring them back to their country. The king of Persia said, um, uh, you can go back and I'm going to help rebuild the temples to all these gods. And the Bible said the king of Persia will help rebuild the temple of the God and that's exactly what happened. So prophecy fulfilled first time Israel came back, prophecy fulfilled second time Israel back. So Ezra and Nehemiah were these two guys that led the Jews back to the promised land in 1950 to 52, Operation Ezra and Nehemiah. Isn't that cool? Airlifted between 120,000 and 130,000 Iraqi Jews. So from Babylon, Persia area again, uh, right back to Israel. In 1984, let my people go, Operation Moses. The Israeli Defense Forces flew 30 flights into Sudan and rescued 8,000 black Jews from starvation. Uh, by the way, the first George W. Bush, the first President Bush, had a hand in making a lot of this possible and using American influence, uh, leaning on the Sudan and Ethiopia for these things to happen. In 1991, Operation Solomon, Israel flew a covert operation transporting 14,325 Ethiopian black Jews to Israel in 36 hours before the country fell into chaos because of civil war. Uh, operation King Solomon, why? Because Remember, the queen of Ethiopia went to Israel, heard Solomon's wisdom, and Judaism went back to Ethiopia. There's always been Ethiopian Jews. And in the New Testament, you see an Ethiopian black Jew worshiping in Jerusalem for the Passover on his way, returning home. Uh, he's introduced to Jesus Christ, and he becomes a Christian. And even when Islam surrounded the Middle East, Ethiopia was always a Christian nation there. And now, at the end of time, God sends these Operation Solomon and all these Ethiopian Jews are able to escape to Israel before the civil war and the country falls into collapse. A neat covert operation happened in 1949 to 1950, brought 49,000 Jews from Yemen to Israel. Why this is neat? It was called Operation Magic Carpet. It's from Arabia. It was also called Operation on Eagle's Wings. And we just heard about soaring on eagle's wings. And it was even called, and this is kind of neat, Operation Messiah's Coming. All told, millions of Jews from 90 countries have returned to Israel. And it's still going on today. When I was a youth, there was more Jews in New York City. That was everybody said. There's more Jews in New York City than in the nation of Israel. That is not true anymore. Uh, more than 10,000 Jews have migrated from Argentina since 2000. 
The Bible says in the end times, God's going to gather his people back to Jerusalem. It's happening right before your eyes. Pay attention. 200,000 Jews with French uh, passports are living in Israel. A third of all Jews in Europe still there are thinking of moving to Israel because of the increase of anti-Semitism there. Uh, in the last few weeks, a huge number of Spanish Jews have migrated back and a huge number of Jews from the Ukraine have migrated back at unprecedented numbers uh, since 1948. These numbers are so large. The United Nations on May 14, 1948, established Israel. In one day, there was no country there. In one day, they said, boom, we've declared there's a nation of Israel. Well, there's this old fellow named Isaiah in, in Isaiah chapter 66, verse 8. He gave this prophecy from the Lord. Who has ever heard of such a thing? Who has ever seen such things? Can a country be born in a day or a nation be brought forth in a moment? Yet no sooner is Zion in labor than she gives birth to her children. I'm getting teared up. I was getting teared up during our song service. Ezekiel 36, 24, I will take you from among the heathen and I will gather you out of your countries and I will bring you into your own land. And by the way, we're still uh, Valley of the Dry Bones coming back and getting flesh. Israel become a nation, but they need the Holy Spirit. They need to be filled up. That's when the, when they, the, when the flesh drees in the oxygen, they live again. The Bible tells us that at the end of time, the Jewish people will look on the one whom they have pierced, and they will mourn like the loss of a firstborn son. Who else has been pierced in history than Jesus Christ? Who are the Jewish people supposed to look on in history that was pierced and caused this huge transformation? And at the end of time, the Jewish people will become the greatest witness to, the, to Jesus Christ when the nation of Israel uh, becomes this powerful missionary force telling the world about Jesus Christ. Uh, there's so many things that we, I want to talk about. We, we can't talk about them all. Daniel 11, uh, 112, verse 4, it tells us that in the end times, travel will be easier and knowledge will increase. Yeah? Revelation 11 uh, tells us that there's going to be two prophets, uh, two prophets in the end days. And these two prophets are going to testify powerfully about God. They're going to minister on the earth for 1,266 days. And after that, the beast, this man in league with Satan, uh, he's going to be given power. He's going to kill these two men. And the Bible then records something bizarre. Listen to this, uh, Revelation chapter 11, uh, ch chapter 11, 7 through 13. When they have finished their testimony, the beast that comes up out of the abyss will make war with them and overcome them and kill them. And their bodies will lie in the streets of the great city, which mystically is called Sodom and Egypt, and also where our Lord was crucified. So we're talking about Jerusalem. Their bodies are going to be laying in the streets of Jerusalem. Those from the peoples and tribes and tongues and nations, peoples and tribes and tongues, all these different languages are going to look at their bodies for three and a half days. They will not pre prevent their bodies, permit their bodies uh, to be buried. And those who dwell on the earth will rejoice over them. So the whole earth is rejoicing over them and celebrate, and they will send gifts to one another because these two prophets tormented the people on earth. They didn't want to hear about God, and they're so overjoyed that somebody took them out. But after three and a half days, the breath of life from God will come into them and they will stand on their feet and a great fear will fall on those watching them. They will hear a loud voice from the heavens saying, come up here. Nice and simple. And then they will go up into heaven in a cloud and their enemies will watch them. In that hour, there will be a great earthquake. A tenth of the city will fall. 7,000 people will be killed in Jerusalem in that earthquake. And the rest of the people will be terrified and give glory to the God of of heaven. When this is written, how are people from all these different tribes and languages and tongues going to be rejoiced over their death? You hop in a boat, it takes you a long time. You're not, you're not going to get to all the tongues and tribes and nations in three and a half days. How is the whole world then going to see them rise up again and go, well, you know what? We got TV now, don't we? We got satellite TV. The whole world can see. The Bible said the whole world's going to see, and you think, well, I don't get it. That, that don't make, that don't make sense. And now you say, oh, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Also, Revelation 9, 16 tells us there's going to be an army from the east that's going to number 200 million people. You know China can field an army that large? The interesting thing about this army from the east, when Revelation was written, 
That was greater than the population of the entire Roman Empire. And people are like, what the heck? Well, that must be a fictitious number. That must be just a number that means a lot, a lot, a heck of a lot of people. It would have been an impossible, ridiculously large number. Guess what? The nation to the east now can field an army that big. Uh, 2 Timothy, uh, I mean, this just goes on and on. Uh, 2 Timothy chapter 3. But know this. So we're supposed to pay attention to the end time stuff. But know this, that in the last days, perilous times will come. Your bubble might be popped. For people will be lovers of themselves, selfish, lovers of money, boasters, arrogant, blasphemers, disobedient to parents. Isn't that a funny thing? That's a strange one to put in there. I've seen it happening all over the world. Children growing up without discipline. Unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanders, without self-control, br brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness or spirituality but denying his power. And from such people, turn away. Be aware, turn away. You know, some of these prophecies we talked about were very specific, but some of them are kind of vague. And you can say, well, that's always, society has its ebbs and flows, as things happen. Uh, some of these prophecies from Jesus and Paul, they're just too vague. So, therefore, I'm not going to concern myself about them. Hmm. Do you think that's why it's in the Bible? Think about it. It's kind of vague, kind of hard to peg down. Therefore, I won't. But Jesus says, know that the end times will be perilous. Turn away when these things happen. Uh, I think that would be missing the point if we decide to ignore these end times things. Actually, Think about it. Maybe there's sufficiently, some of this is sufficiently vague so that every generation of Christian will be on guard. Maybe we're supposed to be looking, every generation of Christians is supposed to be anticipating <coughs> the return of Christ in their time because, guess what? From Johnny English, get busy, Jesus is coming back soon. Uh, you can check that reference later. If Jesus get it come back soon, it's going to change our mentality. It's going to change the way we act, the way we spend our money, the way we spend our time. Uh, okay, let's skip down to verse 4 there now. But you have carefully followed my doctrine, Paul's talking, manner of life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, love, perseverance, persecutions. What? Okay, doctrine, check. Manner of life, okay, try to do that. Purpose, yeah, purpose. Faith, yeah. Long-suffering, oh, skip. Love, okay, yeah. Perseverance, as long as I have to persevere in enjoying life. Uh, perseverance means, like we say in the song, wake up praising God, and no matter what happens during the course of the day, at the end of the day, I'm still praising God. Persecutions. I don't want to see anybody in this church be persecuted for their faith. But what I really don't want to see is any Christian ever deny Jesus Christ because of physical, psychological suffering. Never deny Jesus. He died for us. Not going to let go of him. Afflictions. Yeah, I like to avoid afflictions. I'm allergic to them. Uh, he said, what happened to me at Antium, Antioch, Iconium, Lystra, what persecutions I endured. Paul went through a lot, and then he's saying, imitate him. Be willing to go through hardship for Jesus Christ. Amen? Be willing to endure. Don't, we don't have to complain about everything. We want to glorify God in everything. Does that make any sense? It makes sense right now. <laughs> when, the, when the hardship comes, it's harder. I understand. God understands too. And I'm going to need you guys. Because when life gets difficult, it gets lonely. And uh, we need one another to encourage one another to persevere when life gets hard. Skip down to verse 16. All scripture is inspired by God, even that 10% that we sometimes want to skip. All scripture is inspired by God and is profitable for doctrine. It's profitable for reproof. It's profitable for correction, even the end time stuff, for instructions in righteousness that the man of God, the man and woman of God, may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. All scripture, even this stuff that's hard to pin down, is there for a reason. 
See, being an alarmist is a bad idea. Getting upset about things we can't control, again, bad idea. Setting dates when Christ said you can't set a date seems like a pretty bad idea. I don't know why Christians keep doing it. Uh, that could be wrong, but ignoring more than 10% of what the Bible deals with in the end times, that would probably be wrong too. As Christians, we're supposed to focus on the end times. The Bible itself, the very last verses, turn to the end of your Bible. After Revelation, there ain't nothing left. Revelation chapter 22, you might have some maps or concordance, but before that, the last part of the Bible, Revelation chapter 22, And we're going to be, read the very last words of the Bible. How does this book close? This book that God gave us, how does it close? By pointing us up and telling us, wait for Christ's return. That's a big part of Christianity, eagerly waiting for Jesus Christ's return. Here Jesus is speaking, Revelation 22, 12. Behold, look guys, I'm coming quickly. And my reward is with me to render to every man according to what he has done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Blessed are those who wash their robes so that they may have the right to the tree of life and may enter by the gates of the city. Outside are the dogs and the sorcerers and the immoral persons and the murderers and the idolaters. Okay, why is Jesus Christ talking like this? I thought everybody is okay. Listen. If you want your friends to go to heaven, you better pay attention because there's an outside and an inside to this thing. And right at the end of our Bible, Jesus is saying there's an outside and the inside. The people you love, the people you care about, you want them on the inside. You want them on the inside because outside are the unrepentant. And everyone who loves and practices lying, I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you about these things for the churches. I'm the root of and the descendant of David, the bright morning star. And then the Bible says the Spirit, the Holy Spirit and the bride. Who's the bride? We are the church. The Spirit, the Holy Spirit and the bride together. The Holy Spirit learn, yearning within us and the church yearning with, uh, the church yearning together. The Spirit and the bride say, come. Jesus said, I'm coming soon. And we just say, come back. Come back and set things right. Fix this world. Fix this mess. And I hope I don't have to do a funeral for any of you guys because I want Jesus to come back before we have to do that. But until he comes back, let's do everything we can to love people into the church and not push him away and offend them by our repulsive behavior. Let the gospel offend, not the church. Let the church love. Let's win people to Jesus. The spirit and the bride say, come. And let anyone who hears this book say, come. So in your heart, Christian, you better be saying, come, Jesus, I want you back soon. I can't wait till you come and set things right. And let those who hear say, come. And let the one who is thirsty, <coughs> the one who is thirsty, spiritually dead and dry, let that person come. <coughs> the person who's wondering, is there, is there truth? Is God real? Is there anything to this? Let that person come. Let the one who wishes Take the water of life without cost. I just wish that God would forgive me. I just wish that this was true. I just wish that there was something better than this. I wish I could escape from my nastiness, that the one who wishes come forward and take that water. Stop hesitating. I testify to everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book, and that means you today, if you've never read it before, you've just heard the words of prophecy of the book of Revelation. If anyone adds them, God is going to add to them plagues which are written in this book. If anyone takes away any of the words of this book of prophecy, God will take his part away from the tree of life and the holy city which are written about in this book. He who testifies to these things says, yes, I'm coming quickly. Jesus says, yes, I'm coming quickly. And then we say together, amen. Come, Lord Jesus, the grace of the Lord Jesus be with you all. Amen. Foundation Bible Church Inconveniently located two blocks northwest of the Jamesville Athletic Club.